Well, welcome to Candyland, I mean uh, Lakeview Christian Center. Uh, my name is Evan, I'm one of the pastors here. Let me just clarify something up front. The, the, the trays over here, what's inside of those is not represented by the banners behind them. So we're not going to be serving, this is not a concession stand morning, uh, but we will be having communion at the end of our, our service. Um, well, let's get started this morning. We're continuing our summer Bible Jam study uh, through God's big picture, tracing the storyline of the Bible. Uh, since we are characters in God's story, our lives make sense only in light of that storyline. And as we've seen, the Bible has a particular storyline. And it runs in one direction. It runs away from things like self-definition and self-rescue. It, it introduces us to a God who has made us and who has designed us to live a certain way. It tells us about the fall and how we have rejected God's design and how all of our issues now stem from this basic problem of our sin. Uh, but it also offers us a, a hope for salvation from outside of us. And as we've seen, uh, this storyline runs against the cultural current. And in doing so, it runs right through the human heart, which loves to justify itself. Listen, our, our propensity towards self-righteousness is astounding. Uh, if you doubt this, just get inside of your car and drive around for a little while. Uh, I had this experience about a month ago or so, and I did what preachers do and thought, you know, that would make a good sermon illustration. Uh, but what happened was I, I happened to run a red light. Uh, the light changed faster than I thought. It's funny how they work like that, right? Um, but only a few blocks later on, I noticed somebody else running a red light. And then just instantly there, there arose an attitude of judgment in my heart toward that person. <laughs> uh, what's going on here? Uh, well, welcome to the fallen human heart, right? But here's the irony. Even in our increasingly secular culture, we still have a self-righteousness problem moralism abounds, right? Just to rip from a recent headline, there, there was the case, I'm sure you all know of the, the news item of the, the boy who fell into the gorilla enclosure at the Cincinnati Zoo, which resulted in the gorilla having to be shot. Now, I don't want to see gorillas get shot more than anybody else, but I'll do what it takes to protect innocent human life. But to hear the, the reactions to this, they, they were amazing. Right, right, coming from uh, animal rights activists on the one hand to people who wanted to uh, report this mother to CPS because her son escaped her notice. Uh, they should have to run around chasing my almost two-year-old son for about an hour before they uh, see if they can keep up. Uh, but before we know it, the, the internet is going to move on to get angry about something else. But what's going on here? In our supposedly tolerant age, why do so many people find it so easy to judge? Right, as we've seen in Genesis, we are an inescapably moral people. But our condition now bends towards self-justification. And this is a problem for the gospel story. You know, one of her novels, Flannery O'Connor, describes uh, her main character as having this deep, wordless conviction that the way to avoid Jesus was to avoid sin. Right, you catch that? You can run away from Jesus by running into sin, or you can run away from Jesus by running away from sin if it makes you think you don't need a savior. Now the old form of moralism sought to avoid Jesus by avoiding sin as uh, traditionally defined. But the new moralism seeks to avoid Jesus by avoiding the old categories of sin and, and by not transgressing this new moral code. And so it it just shifts the boundaries though into new categories and so it's no longer in you know sexual ethics but now there is this puritanical concern about things like food or health or animal rights or the environment but we still think that we can be saved by our own goodness right we quoted before from Mark Sayers book Disappearing Church and he says this James K.A. Smith detects in this new moral order a return to another ancient Christian heresy, Pelagianism. 
the belief that salvation can be attained and that human perfectibility is reachable through pure human effort, right? So Pelagius was this man who lived in the 5th century and he taught that we could be saved by our own good choices and efforts if we tried hard enough. And uh, Mark Sayers goes on to say, in the Pelagianism of our contemporary post-Christianity, in which perfection and morality can be achieved by adopting the progressive cultural sensibilities, we fear a different kind of damnation. Listen to this. In the post-Christian imagination, to hold the wrong moral opinions will not send one to hell, but it could see you sent to the outer social darkness to gnash your teeth in social irrelevance or to fall under someone's condemnation in their YouTube comments, right? And he says, uh, by, feeding, by bidding farewell to divinely revealed notions of morality and righteousness, we welcome into our lives the constant worry over our own goodness. Now, while the old moralism obsessed over things like what kind of music you listen to or maybe what uh, movies you watch, the new moralism obsesses over the food you eat and whether or not it's organic or fair trade or the chickens that you're consuming were free range and given a college education. Uh, but rather traditional religion or progressive values, we need to be rescued from our self-salvation project. And that is what the biblical storyline is designed to do. Right, last week we encountered the second chapter of this story, the fall. The Bible wants to bring us face to face with human depravity. And if you don't understand our problem accurately, you'll start looking in the wrong places for the solution. You, you, you think that we can fix ourselves if we can only get our lives in order and get the knowledge and smarts that we need to succeed. Uh, but we're more like a car that's stuck in the mud and you can floor the gas pedal all that you want and it only digs you deeper. You need to be pulled out by someone from the outside. And Genesis 3 is God's invitation for us to take an honest look at ourselves so that we would then turn and look to him. This is how John Calvin begins his institutes. Uh, he says, the miserable ruin into which the rebellion of the first man cast us, especially compels us to look upward. Thus not only will we, in fasting and hunger, seek there what we lack, but in being aroused by fear, we shall learn humility. Right, there's a value in short supply today. Thus from the feeling of our own ignorance, vanity, poverty, infirmity and what is more depravity and corruption right no, nobody's recommending you to think about yourself with those adjectives right there there aren't best-selling books or magazine racks using those descriptions hey see how you're depraved see how you're ignorant see how you have moral poverty but what's going to happen if we recognize these things then we will recognize that the true light of wisdom sound virtue full abundance of every good and purity of righteousness rest in in the Lord alone. Accordingly, the knowledge of ourselves not only arouses us to seek God, but also, as it were, leads us by the hand to find him. And the knowledge of God, it, it exposes the nakedness of our condition despite our attempts to hide behind our perceived goodness. And God has specifically designed the biblical storyline to be an assault on human pride. The gospel is humbling because as we sang about this morning, as Eric shared with us, the basis for God being good to us has nothing to do with us. And the first half of the book of Genesis drives home this point. We see again and again the nature of our sin and how it deserves judgment. But we also see the undeserved graciousness of God. And in these chapters, the gospel is introduced in promise form. So this morning, we're going we're to fly through the first half of this book. And we're going to encounter the initial hopes of redemption that will then get carried on through the rest of scripture. This is the, the promised kingdom topic that we're looking at today. And, and we'll see the God who does not wipe out rebels, the God who makes outrageous promises, and the God who provides a necessary substitute. 
All right, so first, the God who does not wipe out rebels. Turn with me in your Bibles to Genesis chapter three. I don't know if you've ever considered this question before, but why does the Bible even exist? Or put another way, why are there any chapters after Genesis 3? You know, why didn't our summer Bible jam just get cut short last week, leaving humanity behind, lost and condemned and under the sentence of death? The, the Bible is a strange book. You open up the first few pages and you already come to the end. Or at least what ought to be the end. But the story continues. Let's begin reading Genesis 3, verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was be, to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? All right, so instinctively, Adam and Eve sew together fig leaves in an attempt to hide their shame. They, they think that they can fool God and others with outward clothing. And one way or another, we've been doing the same thing ever since. But, but in this setting, God is on the move. He initiates and he is seeking man and, and he does bring judgment. He, he comes carrying a curse. But contained in this curse, there is a promise. And look at verse 15. God says to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his, he his heel. So notice, the woman will have offspring. Right? And that should be surprising to us. And, uh, amazingly, humanity will not be eliminated from the earth. The story will go on. Now, now the serpent is going to have offspring as well. And so this, this mortal conflict is prophesied here. The, the seed of the serpent will bite the heel of the seed of the woman. And this is deadly. But it will prove to be the enemy's end when the woman's seed crushes the head of the snake. And from this point on, Everything in the Bible is looking to this. Every story, every longing and expectation anticipates the coming Redeemer. And so in verse 21, God clothes Adam and Eve with animal skins. He's helping them see that only blood sacrifice can cover the shame. Only death can bring them out of the death into which they have descended. And in the chapters that follow, we trace humanity's storyline east of Eden. As Pastor Keith shared with us uh, last week, it is marked by the loss and confusion and sorrow that characterize the fall. But there is also a tone of hope that persists. There's a clinging to the promise. Right, Adam names his wife Eve because he recognizes that, that she's going to be the mother of all the living. Uh, but by implication, she is also the mother of all the dying. And she loses her son Abel to murder and her son Cain to banishment. And so the, the, this struggle between Cain and, and Abel, it's the first expression of the conflict that exists between the offspring of the serpent and the woman. And, and then the text says that Abel's blood cries out to God from the ground. But as the author of Hebrews will later tell us, we, we need someone's blood who speaks a better word than the blood of, of Abel. When Seth is born, Eve says in chapter 4, verse 25, God has given me another seed instead of Abel, perhaps thinking that maybe Seth 
is going to be the promised redeemer. But then the genealogy in chapter 5 of Seth's line is just this constant refrain of he died and he died and he died and he died. Humanity has a striking mortality rate but God lets mankind feel the pressure of judgment. But then we come to one exception. Chapter 5 verse 24, Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. And there's just a glimmer of hope here. We're not given a lot of information but we're reminded that it's possible to escape the curse there is apparently a way out of death. In Genesis 6, mankind descends into depravity and the people who are supposed to fill the world with God's image have covered the land with their self-interest and their hatred and violence and so God is going to press a reset button. He's gonna flood away the evil. And again, we would think the story would come to an end. But then in verse 8 of chapter 6, it says that Noah found favor with God. And, and, and don't let that phrase trouble you. The, the, the Hebrew expression is really just a way of saying that Noah encountered the grace of God. Noah became a friend of God. God hasn't forgotten Genesis 3.15. He will not remove the woman's offspring from the face of the earth. He establishes a covenant with Noah, this, this strong binding relational commitment that we'll, we'll come back to in our, our next section. But but the flood is a kind of new creation, right? Like in Genesis 1, the chaotic waters once again cover the land and, and disorder spills over into all of the order that God has established. The good boundaries that God put in place are undone and now the earth becomes a global grave site as God remakes the world. And the waters recede and Noah, like a second Adam, is told to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Now, if, if we're reading this for the first time, we might think that this solves the sin problem, right? Humanity gets a fresh start, a new beginning. And if, as Pelagius thought, we're not intrinsically depraved, maybe we can learn better behavior and improve this new society that God is building with Noah. But there's a problem. While sin was washed away outside of the boat, it was carried inside of the people, inside of the boat. <laughs> Uh, you know, for all of its, uh, its issues and, and problems, uh, the, Darren Aronofsky's film Noah actually gets this right. In, in the movie, Noah's character is played by Russell Crowe and he is convinced that he and his family need to die without descendants in order to remove the violence from the world. And the thing is, he's right. But then nothing in the world would get repaired. And God had... Another plan. Notice what God says in Genesis chapter 8, verse 21. I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Sin is tenacious and it marks every person that is born after this with one exception that comes later in the biblical storyline. But this is worth taking a closer look at. Notice what he says. Not in spite of the fact that man's intention is, is evil from childbirth, but for or because. This doesn't seem to follow. Right, by the way, we, we believe the Bible is inspired down to the conjunctions. But what does this mean? It means that judgment in and of itself will not fix this. Right? Flood waters are not able to make us clean. We have a radical problem. And it will require a radical solution. More radical than covering the world with flood waters. And by the way, in the Bible, one of the functions of judgment is to drive us to mercy. In judgment, God shocks us out of our self-sufficiency. He takes away the strange comfort that we find in our own fallenness and he makes us feel desperate so that we would look to a savior. 
James Hamilton says, everyone who gets saved is saved through judgment. All who flee to Christ and confess that he is Lord and that God has raised him from the dead do so because they realize their need for a savior. They realize their need for a savior because they have become convinced that God is holy, that they are sinful and that God will judge. In a sense, they feel the force of God's condemning justice. They sense the weight of the wrath of God that remains upon them and they recognize that Jesus is their only hope. And so judgment is an act of mercy in this storyline. So the author of Hebrews writes in chapter 11, verse seven, by faith, Noah condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Condemnation makes it clear that if we're to attain righteousness, it can only be received by faith in someone else's work. And that is all over Genesis. In chapter 9, God reaffirms his covenant with Noah and with all creation. He promises that he will never again destroy the earth. uh, That the normal course of seasons and seed time and harvest will continue uninterrupted. And so this Noahic covenant, it means that God's going to preserve a place for redemption to happen. There remains a setting for the promised one to come. And he demonstrates this by placing his bow in the sky. And I know, you know, we're used to this being cute. You know, a lot of little children's nurseries are painted with rainbows and Noah's Ark with the giraffes extending their necks out of the, you know, it's all disproportionate to the size of the boat and stuff like that. Um, but this rainbow imagery, it's, it's actually the same word in Hebrew for a bow and arrow. It comes from the imagery of, of warfare. But God has hung up his weapon. It's no longer pointed toward earth. I don't know about you, but I like to get my theology from children's books. And the the Jesus Storybook Bible by Sally Lloyd-Jones says, God's war bow was not pointing down at his people. It was pointing up into the heart of heaven. After they leave the ark, Noah plants a vineyard and uh, gets plastered drunk and ends up naked in his tent and becomes violated by one of his sons. And so just like his forefather, Adam, Noah fails in a garden and becomes naked and ashamed, reminding us again, we need a new and better Adam. Genesis 11, it brings us to the Tower of Babel. Uh, What Keith described last week as man's big self-improvement project. This is our attempt to reach up to heaven by our own ingenuity and achievement. But God loves to mess with fallen human achievement. And what I love about this text, it says in verse uh, verse 5 of chapter 11 that uh, the Lord has to come down to see their mighty tower, right? Uh, they, they think that they can build up to heaven and it's like from God's vantage point, he can barely even notice what's going on down there. And so uh, God frustrates their efforts by messing with their ability to communicate with one another. Uh, he recognizes that uh, sinful, self-interested people consolidated under one nation and government with centralized power is never a good thing. And uh, by the way, that's one of the reasons why in in the Christian tradition, uh, there has been a value for the separation of powers. Ever since Genesis 3, absolute power corrupts absolutely. Uh, But God scatters the people. And again, this is both an act of judgment and an act of mercy. Because as as you follow the story, you realize God is separating the nations because he is planning to work through one nation in particular. He he disperses the people who are attempting to make a name for themselves because he wants to call out a people who will bear his name. I don't know if you realize this, but uh, in Genesis 3 through 11, there is more history in these chapters than in the rest of the Bible. More time elapses between Genesis 3 through 11 than between Genesis 12 through the book of Revelation. And it's because it's all speeding forward and ramping up to one particular event. In chapter 12, the narrative slows down significantly and the rest of Genesis is spent talking about one man in particular, 
and his family. And that's where we'll spend the rest of our time. So we see the God who makes outrageous promises. Turn to Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. Thank you guys for flipping along with me this morning. The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great. What, what they were grasping for at Babel, God's just going to graciously dispense on this man, right? So that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And in this section here, we're given the first expression of what's called the Abrahamic covenant, right? And our, our goal in the Summer Bible Jam is to help you understand how is the Bible put together? How do you trace the storyline? And, and in order to understand this, you, you really have to understand the, the concept of covenant and what gets established here in particular, in the Bible, a, a covenant is a relational commitment that's established with the strongest terms. O. Palmer Robertson writes, A covenant is a bond in blood sovereignly administered. When God enters into a covenantal relationship with men, he sovereignly institutes a life and death bond. Now we'll see how this is a bond in blood in a moment, but first we need to realize uh, this is sovereignly administered. Right, let, let's remember who God is in the biblical storyline, which is just another way of saying, let's remember who God is in reality. <laughs> uh, he's the creator. We do not make God. God makes us. We do not control God. God controls us. Which means that if we're going to be in a relationship with God, it will always be on his terms. He is sovereign. He has no needs. He cannot be manipulated. He's not some sort of mutual back scratcher. Listen, we have nothing convincing to offer God, nothing persuasive that would incline him toward us as if he needed anything. And by the way, as Pastor Peter shared when we looked in Genesis uh, chapter 1 and 2, this God has existed in eternity past, perfectly content, perfectly happy in his own triune being. He wasn't needing any new friends in that moment, certainly not sinners like you and me. And so if we're going to relate to God, it's only going to be because he has determined to relate to us. And this again flies in the face of every form of human-centered religion or values. Whether that's some sort of old school legalism that tries to get on God's good side by being on your best behavior. Or if that's the prosperity gospel thinking that if you only believe hard enough. And you know whether you're uh, believing in God or yourself is never really that clear. Uh, then God's going to bless you and he's going to grant you success in life. Or if that's some form of uh, postmodern spirituality that sees God is just there to affirm your life decisions and provide a meaningful experience for you and kind of applaud you from the sidelines and just get on board with your plan for life. All of these things, all of these visions for life and spirituality place God at the end of our leash. And that is not the God of the Bible. As D.A. Carson puts it, God writes his own agreements. He says, do not misunderstand. The truth that God does not need us does not mean that he does not respond to us, that he cannot delight in us, that he might not be pleased with us. He does respond to us, but he responds not out of some intrinsic need in his own being or character, but out of the entire volition or the freedom of his perfections and will. And if we're honest, we like a picture of God who blesses us because of something in us. We like the way that that makes us feel. But the story of Abraham doesn't allow this. In Genesis 12, God finds a man named Abram who up to this point had no interest other than just developing his business in Haran and bowing down to his tribal deities. Deities. 
But here God decides to send him to a new location with a new purpose. Now before we just kind of jump into this passage and replace Abram's name with ours and interpret this as God's going to send us on some new adventure and, and support us, don't miss the point. Right, since we, we don't know our Bibles well, we tend to interpret these stories individualistically and so we apply them to ourselves in the wrong way. But Abraham is not first and foremost some guy whose example we're supposed to follow. He's God's covenant representative. God promises to bless all the nations through his offspring. And so if you're just dropping in here and you disconnect it from the storyline, you'll miss what's taking place. God is beginning to reverse the curse of Genesis 3. Right? Remember in Genesis 3, God caused there to be pain in childbirth for the woman and he cursed the ground for the man but he promised to send a rescuer through the woman's seed. Well, what does God promise to Abraham here? And as you read through the, the rest of the story, God is going to cause a barren woman, Sarah, under the curse of childbirth, to bear a son, a son who's going to be a descendant of Adam and Eve in the line of the woman's seed, and he will give to them a land that will not be a curse, but a blessing. In other words, God's beginning to fulfill the promise, and everything else in the Bible flows from this. John Stott says, it may truly be said without exaggeration that not only the rest of the Old Testament, but the whole of the New Testament are an outworking of these promises of God. In, in the Bible, there's what you might call one covenant of grace, right? That's a good vocabulary word for us to know. A, a, a covenant of, of grace and it's, it's first promised in Genesis 3.15, but it's given clear expression to Abraham and it forms the basis for all of God's interactions with his people, Old and New Testament. God is one people and one plan of salvation. And, and notice how this covenant with Abraham, it's a reference point for all of God's redemptive actions. We see God's redemption in Exodus is the Abrahamic covenant at work? Exodus 2, 24, this is in your notes. And God heard their groaning. And God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac and Jacob. Which is why, as, as Keith helped us see a couple months ago, uh, the, the law given at Sinai in Exodus is, is not some separate plan of salvation. It's not some... Option B for people who really want to come to God based upon their own obedience, right? The, 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 the Mosaic Covenant, the, the covenant at Sinai, it's the expression of what God promised to Abraham. And take all that all the way to the incarnation. It's the fulfillment of the covenant with Abraham. Luke chapter 1, uh, verse 68, Zechariah says, Bless, blessed be the Lord God of Israel for he has visited and redeemed his people as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old to show the mercy promised to our father and to remember his holy covenant. The oath that he swore to, to whom? Our father Abraham, right? Our father Abraham. And so when this baby is born in Bethlehem, it is a declaration from heaven of I haven't forgotten 2,000 years later he still remembers what he promised and so Paul refers to this promise in Genesis 12 as an expression of the gospel Galatians 3 verse 8 and the scripture this is a remarkable verse foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham saying, in you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. How is it that Paul can call this the gospel? Well, because it's God's favor and blessing extending to all people, not based in human achievement, but in redemption through a son of promise. You know, Eric helped us Consider this during our worship time this morning. Would you show up this morning believing about God? 
Why would God be good to you? Why would he care? Why would you not just be a face that's lost in the crowd? Why would he issue forth promises to you? Are those reasons based mainly in you, in your history, or your current choices, or, or how you feel you're meeting your personal standards or the expectations of people? That is not why God accepted Abraham. These are outrageous promises to the undeserving. Turn over to chapter 15. Some time has passed, and uh, Isaac has yet to be born at this point. And Abraham's not getting any younger. Sarah certainly isn't. <laughs> um, and so Abraham comes to God and says, maybe, maybe there's another plan that we're going on here. Maybe it's not supposed to be my son. Uh, are we supposed to reinterpret this? And this is what uh, God says. Uh, chapter 15, verse 3. Abram said, Behold, you've given me no offspring, and a member of my household shall be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir, buddy. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and he said, look toward heaven and number the stars if you're able to number them. And then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. And, and the insight Abraham's given in this moment is, is not the visible reality of seeing that he has a son and all these children. But God calls him by faith to trust in the promise, to trust in his word that he will be faithful. And then the text says in verse 6, and he believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. All right, that verse, Genesis 15 verse 6, Abraham believed God, it was counted to him as righteousness. It is one of the most quoted verses from the Old Testament in the New Testament. And in your Bible uh, reading plan for this week, you'll spend some time in Romans 4, where Paul argues that this verse in chapter 15, uh, it occurs before Abraham was circumcised in chapter 17. And so he reasons from that to our justification uh, by faith in Christ's work alone and not by any good work that we do, like circumcision or anything else. Right? These are the things that we need to know. Von Robert says, Abraham was accepted by God not on the basis of his own goodness, but by faith in the promises of God. That has always been the way of salvation for sinful human beings. We can never deserve a place in God's family. Our only hope is to trust in the gospel. And this gets clearly illustrated in the covenant ceremony that follows in this chapter. When you establish a covenant, the, the verb for ratifying a covenant in Hebrew is, is the word to cut, right? You cut a covenant. And, and this is because the covenant ceremony, it involved cutting animals in half, right? This is a bloody event. And, and the parties of the agreement would walk through the dismembered animals, but there would be this assumption that if either one of them broke the terms of the covenant, that then they were to be divided just like those animals, right? You're, you're, you're essentially proclaiming a curse on yourself that if I violate my word, if I'm unfaithful to you, let me be separated. And by the way, husbands and wives, that gives you a little bit of a picture of the background when, when Jesus says, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Uh, there's a covenantal union that has been established between you. Uh, but this was a commitment of loyalty on pain of death. It's a bond in blood. And that's what God has Abraham do here. But there's one significant difference. Look at verse 12. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abraham. And behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. And then verse 17. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, to your offspring, I will give this land. 
And so like what's gonna happen in the book of Exodus, a blazing fire cuts through the darkness and passes down the aisle of the dismembered animals. And Abraham is sleeping like a baby. God walks alone. God bears the burden and the penalties of the covenant on his own. If the covenant is broken, God is the one who will break. Remember who it is that God's pledging himself to here, right? This is the guy who, you know, in the chapters that follow, can't seem to figure out whether or not he wants to tell people that his wife is his, his wife or his sister, and he's just kind of up to his own little manipulative measures. This is the guy that God finds uh, worshiping foreign gods. He probably worshiped the sun and the moon before he encountered uh, Yahweh. This is the man whose son Isaac is an indecisive wimp uh, whose grandson Jacob is, is a con man and trickster and one of those sleazy personalities that you kind of walk away from when you see them coming. Uh, Jacob's jealous and scheming uh, sons are going to sell their brother into slavery. And these are the patriarchs, <laughs> right? Uh, these are the people that God has bound himself to by covenant. But where the curses fall, they fall on God alone. In the final scene from Abraham's life that we'll look at this morning, God gives us a picture of how that's going to happen. Turn over to Genesis chapter 22. Verse 1. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I will tell you. And can you imagine this? You know, those of us in here as parents, your, your mind just races to think of your own children. You just think of what this would mean, how this would feel. And, and, and for many readers of the Bible today, this is, this is a troubling command. Not sure what to do with this. It, it seems unreasonable. It seems irrational. A lot of new atheists today would, would say that it's evil. But this is not some sort of arbitrary request that God brings to Abraham here. Remember, Genesis is, is written to a particular original audience. And that is the generation of Israelites who are coming out of the Exodus. They had experienced Passover. And so they already know the firstborn belongs to God. And they certainly know that any sinner's life can be forfeited. But here God is calling for Abraham to sacrifice not only his child, but the child of promise. Right? It, it looks like God is asking Abraham to kill the promise. John Owen says this, he says, sometimes through God's providence there may appear to be inconsistency between God's commands and his promises. Nothing but faith bowing the soul to divine sovereignty can reconcile this and listen. When you, when you experience the trials of life, when you experience uncertainty and confusion and how could God do this or why would he want this of me, you better know who this God is. You better have spent more time knowing this book because that's what makes you survive. And he's convinced about something in God. Verse three, Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and he saw the place from afar. 
Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and will come again to you. And actually we could render this a little bit differently than this translation makes explicit here because you see there's a plural verb here. We will go and we will worship and we will certainly return to you. Who's we? Abraham and Isaac, right? The promise will live. And, and the author of Hebrews says in chapter 11 that Abraham had faith that, that God could even raise the dead. Since Isaac was born when Abraham's body was as good as dead, Abraham already knew that God could bring life out of death. And so verse 6 Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son and he took in his hand the fire and the knife so they went both of them together and Isaac said to his father Abraham my father and he said here I am son he said behold the fire and the wood but where is the lamb for a burnt offering the, the, the word for seeing shows up a lot in this chapter Abraham sees the place from afar Isaac sees the wood and he sees the fire and he doesn't see any lamb. And Abraham says, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. And the, and the word, God will provide, it's the verb for to see. God will see to it that there is an offering. And, and it's from this that we get uh, our name for God, Jehovah Jireh. Our God provides. Again, don't treat that fact in isolation. Don't just take it out of this text and apply it to anything that you want, right? Provide what? A Mercedes? <laughs> uh, no. Something so much more important than that. And we know this story, right? God stops the sacrifice and he provides a substitute. Abraham lifts his eyes and it says he sees a ram with his horns caught in the thicket. He sees what God saw to do. And so Jesus says in John 8 that Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. What God requires, he provides. Eric, you can go ahead and come back up, man. We know a sinner cannot be offered for another sinner. In fact, what this text shows us is that God, frankly, isn't interested in our sinful contribution. But there would be another son of promise who would be called to die. The only son loved by his father and while he would ask in a garden if a, another way would be available no substitute would be provided for him. And he would climb the same mountain and he would carry wood on his back and he would be the lamb with his head caught in the thorns slain for you and me. But the son of Abraham would rise from the dead and so bring life out of death for his people. He would reverse the judgment of Genesis 3 and as the flood waters covered the world, he would make his blessings flow far as the curse is found. Let's stand together.